We're going to continue our series, Are We Aware? This morning we're going to be talking about, Are We Aware of the Power of Praise? And my thought is that for some of you who have grown up around the things of the Lord, of course you're aware of it, but how much are we aware of it? That's really what I want to know. Is it governing and guiding our lives? Is it something that we do instinctively? Does it flow freely from our heart or... Is it something that we have to be prompted to do, reminded to do, encouraged to do? And no matter where you are, I think there's something in the message for each and every one of us this morning. And in some areas of your life, praise may freely flow. In other areas, you find that maybe that river of praise might be dammed up a little bit. And uh, there might be some things we have to remove so that praise flows continually from our heart back unto the Lord. And you're going to understand more about what that means as we get into our text and our subject matter this morning. So let's take a look again at your outline because we want to have a good working definition of awareness. It means to become enlightened that something is happening or exists. And you know one of my favorite jokes is there's three kinds of people in the world, those that make things happen, those, things, those people that watch things happen, and those say, uh, what happened? And uh, we, we sometimes find ourselves in the latter end, something happens or, or something's going on, and we, we look back and say, what in the world just happened? And, and we may, at, at that moment, be you know, uh, uh, conscious for the first time that something actually was going on, and now we're just sort of getting connected. And and uh, sort of, even though we came to the party late, thank God we're at the party now, and we're starting to become more and more conscious of the things of the Lord and what's happening uh, around us. Awareness occurs through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and one's willingness to hear and respond with obedience. I think if we're willing and obedient, we eat the good of the land. There's there's people that are willing, but their follow through isn't that good, and. and and then there's people that are obedient, but their attitude is lousy. Have you ever been around someone like that at work? And you just sort of check the box. I mean, they were doing it, but their heart wasn't in it. And everyone uh, understands that, that we, if you partner willingness with obedience, uh, what a great environment that is. And, and you really get a lot of, of things done, and people's lives are, are enriched. So through developing, we, knew, we know we, we need to develop a tender and, and sensitive spirit so we become more aware of the Lord speaking, guiding, and even his, his times where he's warning us in life. Uh, and he wants to do all of those things as our good shepherd. So our, our opening text uh, are found in, uh, in Psalms 100 and uh, then uh, we'll go to 146, 147, 148, 149, 150. How's that sound? All right, here we go. Psalms 100. It says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we not ourselves. For we are the people, his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Now, I know that some of us... Uh, may be a little hesitant about singing, but I, I, I want to encourage you that everyone can sing, but not everyone can sing for a living, but each and every one of us can sing. So when it says only those that can sing should sing unto the Lord, no, that's not what the scripture says. It, we all have a voice, we all can sing, and, and before the Lord, it's a beautiful melody. And so I want to encourage you, even if you don't uh, if, if you discount your own uh, abilities or, or ability, you know, to sing, remember who you're singing unto and what you're singing about. And, and I think that'll help us to sing out even bit, a bit more. We go to uh, Psalms 146. We just turn to the right a little bit, Psalms 146. And let's continue this narrative about praise. We're going to read the first two verses. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. That means with all your emotions, your will, your intellect. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. So this is a, 
a reminder that one of the things that we need to be doing while we're alive is praising the Lord. Psalms 147, the first verse, it says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant and praise is beautiful. One translation says it is becoming. Another translation said it is pleasing unto his ears. It's pleasing unto his ears. Psalms 148, verses 1 through 6, it says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you stars and light, praise him you heaven of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created so he established them forever and forever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. So now here's a call by God to all of creation, to all of what he has created, to praise him and to continually offer praise unto him. Psalms 149, the first verse says, Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. So that means when we're gathered together, uh, like we are this morning, that we should praise the Lord. What does it mean to sing a new song? Well, there are songs and melodies that are in the heart of each and every one of us as believers. It's, a, it's an individual psalm about the good things that the Lord has done for you. So when we're together in the New Testament, it says that we should sing with our understanding. We can also sing in the Spirit. And so there's these moments of inspiration where you sing a new song unto the Lord. It's spontaneous, and it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's an outflow of the good things that the Lord has done for you as the good things that the Lord has done for you. And those are the things that we, we praise the Lord about. And then let's look at Psalms 150. It says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. So now we're getting into the portion of our praise where it's unto him for all the things that he has done, his mighty acts. Verse 3, praise him with the sound of the trumpet and with the lute, the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And all the people said, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So here's, here's some instruction. The Bible commands all living creatures to praise the Lord, all creatures in heavens and all those that are on the earth. And one Hebrew word for praise is yada, which means praise, to give thanks, or to confess. So there's several different Greek and Hebrew words uh, that express the word praise, and so it means to give thanks or to confess. The word confess in Scripture means to be in agreement with God. So we're not saying something contrary to what the Lord says we're saying something in agreement or in unison to what he's already asked us to say. A second word often translated praise in the Old Testament is the word zamar, which means to sing out loud, to sing audibly. And then a third word translated praise is halat, and it's the root word for hallelujah, which means praise, honor, or praise the Lord. It's commendable, and it's something that he is worthy of. So all three of these words contain the idea of giving thanks and honor to the one and only to whom honor is due. So when we express praise audibly from a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving for all that the Lord has done, for all that he is doing, and for all that is to come, then we're agreeing that he is great and greatly to be praised. We're not doing this to puff the Lord up, we're doing it so that we're reminded in the midst of all of life's battles, in the midst of having heavy hearts, and at times in, in the midst of experiencing exuberant victory and blessing of the Lord, that there's one that we always need no matter what's going on in our life. We need to have our eyes on him because he helps us through the battle, he helps us when we're hurting, and he's the one that gives us the victory. And so let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So God is not, he's not an egomaniac, and God is not a narcissist. God isn't saying for us to do this so that he would be the benefactor, but so that we would be the benefactor. 
we have a tendency to forget. How many of you have uh, a, a, a little bit of, of amnesia? And uh, some of it's selective memory, and uh, I understand that. And, but when we're praising the Lord and our eyes are on Him, we're stirred once again to uh, uh, you know, be reminded of, of where He's brought us from. He's brought us out of the miry clay, set our feet upon the rock, and the Lord is worthy to be praised. Where would we be without the Lord? I know where I would be exactly where I was before I came to him. I would be lost and blind and, and confused. I'd be uh, taken advantage of and deceived by darkness, and uh, I would be wayward. And, and, but the Lord came, the good shepherd came into my life, and thank God that my eyes were open and I'm not lost anymore, I'm found, and I'm not wayward, but I belong to his fold, and, and I'm not confused, I have peace. And, and even in the midst of, of everything that the world can throw at us, and it can throw a lot at us, it can't take our praise away from us. Our praise is something that is a mighty, mighty force, and it's, it's powerful in our life. And when you understand that there's power and there's purpose in praise, then you and I engage in praise more freely and more faithfully. We understand what's the premise of our praise. What's the purpose of it? What does it produce? And what happens when we become a people of praise? I think then we are, are more than willing to say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin to live a life of praise and gratitude. Now, I put in your notes that praise is synonymous in Scripture with prayer and thanksgiving. They're, you can't separate them. They're all just part of the same conversation throughout Scripture. Wherever you see an admonition to praise, you also see an admonition to give thanks, and you also see an admonition to pray and to pray uh, with a heart of gratitude. So I put that prayer and thanksgiving can be expressed in communing with the Lord. That means fellowshipping with Him. That means just talking to the Lord. Through the course of your day, you can just talk to the Lord. You can talk to the Lord about anything and everything. It's not like uh, you could shock him. There's no shock value with God. You, you, just anything and everything you can talk to him about. He's aware of it all. Everything lays open to him. And so he's willing to converse and to commune with you around the issues of life. And, and, and in that, we can give him praise. We can give him praise. We talk about petitioning. That just means bringing our prayer requests before the Lord. And the Lord receives our prayer request. He never turns us away. Scripture says the ears of the Lord are open to the prayers of the righteous. And through Christ, we have been classified as righteous or in right standing with God. And so he invites us to come. And so we can bring our desires, our petitions before him. And Scripture says that we know we have the petitions we desire of Him because we ask according to His Word. So we're just bringing His Word back to Him when we're petitioning Him. We're interceding for our nation. We could be interceding for a loved one, a co-worker, for the lost, and uh, for friends. So we have to remember that when we talk about the subject matter of praise, it's not just something that we do, it's the people we want to become. We want to be those people of praise. And we want to do it continually, not occasionally. And I think that uh, you all know me well enough that uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a persistent pastor in us being consistent. You know, because I think when we do something occasionally, it's sort of like throwing darts in the dark. You're gonna, you may hit the board occasionally, but if you turn on the light and praise helps turn on the light and bring the light, and then you're not playing darts in the dark anymore, and you have an opportunity uh, to be to be more effective and to be more fruitful and to be more influential and powerful in your life for the glory of God. So praise is something that we just don't offer up, it's offering up ourselves as an instrument of praise and as a person of praise. Now, I want you to really consider that. In 1 Thessalonians, let's flip back into the New Testament. And uh, as always, I'll give you more than enough scripture uh, for this particular subject matter. And, and we will not be able to cover it all this morning, but I, I uh, trust that it'll be a blessing to you as, as you go home and continue to look at your outline and 
to go over the various scripture references that we didn't have a chance to cover. So 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, very familiar portion of scripture. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And, and it, I, I give you permission to write in your Bible. And next to these three verses, would you, would you recognize the instruction and the admonition is to do it like continually? So let's look at that again so this can really register. Verse 16, rejoice occasionally. Is that what it says? How many of you? No, don't let me pull the wool over your eyes here now. All right. It says rejoice always. It says pray occasionally when you feel like it. No, but sometimes if we're not careful, our feelings determine our, our, not only our attitude but our actions. But it says pray without ceasing. So we know that this isn't based on the circumstances. This is based on something that's much bigger. This is based on our faith and the faithfulness of God. So pray, pray without ceasing, day and night, day and night. When Scripture uses that term, and it uses it quite often, day and night, it's just trying to awaken us to whether it's in the morning, afternoon, or evening, that praise is always acceptable. Prayer is always welcome. And, and we have God's ear. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God for Christ Jesus for you. So how many of you have, have asked that, that $64,000 question in your life before? I mean, Pastor, what is the will of God for me? Well, I mean, there's the, the, the will of God for us all. And it's got not, not God's will that any would perish. That's one of, of the great truths about the will of God. But all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. But you know a, another aspect of the will of God is that we become the people of thanksgiving. That we be a people of gratitude, show appreciation and adoration towards the Lord. It says in everything, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. The word in, even though it's small, is big, it's powerful. It didn't say for everything, but in everything. Because in everything, if we praise the Lord, there's power, there's ability that God gives us to go through anything. In everything, give thanks. Not for, but in everything. So in everything, in every season, in every circumstance, in every situation, our eyes are on the Lord because he's the one that helps us. If you had a victory, he prevents you from getting proud. If you're in the midst of the battle, he upholds and strengthens you. If you're hurt and wounded, he comes and pours in the oil and the wine. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And when we offer up our thanks and we praise the Lord, then we are the ones that benefit because we experience his might and his power. Sometimes the word power trips us up because we have a lot of people that are power hungry in our culture. And we can see that when people are power hungry, what it can do and what it can create within a culture and the problems that can arise. But when we're praising the Lord and we're giving glory and honor and thanks and praise and we're offering prayers up to him, then he gives us his ability, his ability. And that's what, what the word power is synonymous with in Scripture. After Jesus' uh, resurrection, he told the early disciples, he said, go to Jerusalem and, and not many days from now you'll be filled with power from on high. The word power there is, is a very interesting word because it's not the word dunamis. It's not the word as in, as in explosive power or might or ability. Uh, it is as in practical daily overcoming life scenarios. I'm going to give you the ability to be my witness in everyday life. So the ability that, that God gives us, the power that God gives us, is synonymous with those that are people of praise. And he comes, he uplifts us, he upholds us. I love this verse in the Psalms that God is described as the glory and the lifter of our head. Well, there's a lot of things that would cause our countenance to be down or our gait to be down or our eyes to be down. In those moments when we choose 
in everything to give thanks unto the Lord, then our eyes have to look up. And he is the glory and the lifter of our head. And we begin to sing those songs and hymns. And we're reminded once again that great is his faithfulness. I want to now draw your attention to the next portion of your outline. It says, we are to praise the Lord or the name of the Lord in every season of life. Follow this scenario with me. It's not a very hard illustration to follow or analogy to connect with. But in life, in uh, this part of the world that, that we live in, we experience four seasons. We, we go through winter, and we really go through winter. Uh, other people uh, may say that it's the winter uh, season uh, where they live, but uh, if they're far south enough, we know you haven't experienced winter until you go where we live. And uh, so we have winter. There's spring, which we're in the midst of spring right now, and spring is a little bipolar right now in the state of Iowa. Then we have summer, and then we have fall. So if God is, is continually to be praised, let's consider uh, each of these just for a moment. I just want to give you a few words that I feel uh, will help us to understand. In the winter seasons of your life, at times where things are barren or dormant, things look lifeless. From an outward perspective, it doesn't really look like anything's happening, or if something is happening, we're not happy about it. It looks like things are shriveling on the vine and going dormant. And, and uh, in that moment, should, should we withhold our praise from the Lord? No, because there's beauty in the winter. And we understand it serves a function and a purpose in our life. So it's not a hard parallel to draw either. There's the winter that we experience from where we live from a physical standpoint, but there's also winter seasons in our life. It doesn't mean just because the outward shell of something looks dormant or dead that it's dormant or dead. It's not. It's resting. I want to say that again because the spring reveals that there's always new beginnings and there's always new growth. So when spring comes, what we think of is Fresh growth, new growth, new life, new beginnings. Well, where did that come from? Something that looked dead. I know that there's many of you in here and you really enjoy gardening. And you have coming up in your gardens, your flower gardens right now, you have all the perennials. Well, they've looked like they've just been gone with the wind since last fall. And all you've had is dirt. And now what do you have? You have these beautiful plants with all the beautiful colors. Well, that came from what? Something that looked dead. But it wasn't dead. It may have been dormant. But I want to use this word because Scripture uses this word. In the winter of our life, there's something that we need to be doing is resting because spring is coming and God has something new for us. And that's where we give thanks to the Lord. Lord, even though nothing on the surface looks like it's, it's changing, the circumstances don't look any different, but I know spring is coming. Just like winter came, spring's going to come. Summer, we think of uh, things growing and things coming all the way to fruition. We're getting ready, the farmers are, to get into the fields. What a great lesson in life that is if we'd only pay attention. All those fields that have been lying and just look, you know, brown and parched are going to be green and fertile. And through the summer, everything is going to grow and develop. And soon and very soon, we're going to see fruit in all of their labor. And then, of course, we think of fall as a time of harvest where we rejoice in God's bounty and his blessing and we gather in. And why do we gather in? We gather in not only so that our needs can be supplied, but so that we can supply other people's needs. And these are the lessons over and over again that God gives us naturally so we can understand the parallel with them spiritually in our lives. And God awakens us to these things so that we would not grow weary in doing good and we would never withhold our praise from him. I am uh, in the same category that you are. In winter, I long for spring. In spring, I long for summer. In summer, I look forward to fall. We always have our eyes looking forward. 
And in the Christian life, no matter what season that you're in, because they don't always parallel with the natural seasons, no matter what season that you're in, you always have something to look forward to and to praise the Lord for. In everything, give thanks. That's God's will for each and every one of us. So in the battles of life, yeah, praise is a weapon against our enemy. That's where there's power in praise. When our heart is heavy, praise is a garment that brings God's comfort. You put on the garment of praise for the spirit of what? Heaviness. When your heart is heavy and overwhelmed, put on praise. And praise is becoming, praise is beautiful, praise is pleasing unto the Lord. Praise is powerful. There's another truth about praise that all of us have to understand if we're going to experience the power of praise. And there's no such thing as silent praise. There's no such thing in Scripture as silent praise. Praise must be expressed. And then in times of victory, praise is our expression of gratitude to the Lord. And I've given you several different references in Scripture that you can go back and you can be reminded that praise is powerful. Praise is powerful. In the midst of a battle, the Lord sent the praisers ahead of God's people, and they said, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And all the enemies of the Lord were defeated through praise. Let me share with you briefly, just briefly, that praise, praise is a weapon. It not only protects and guards your heart from its enemy, the enemy is, of praise is complaining. The temptation in different seasons of life is not to give thanks or to praise or to give glory to God or to pray, but it's to find fault or to complain. But praise is powerful in that it protects our heart from that temptation. We'll talk about that specifically a little bit more. But praise is a powerful, powerful ally that we have. It's interesting, too, that praise, that praise is something that the enemy, the enemy of our soul is subject to. I'm just planting some seed for some upcoming thoughts that I'm about to share with you. But it, there, most of our battles in life are not against flesh and blood. They're not against people. Scripture tells us that. But they're spiritual or they're emotional. And when you praise the Lord, you begin to set things in motion. And the heavenly hosts begin to work on your behalf and God's presence begins to move in a powerful way. So I've, uh, I've given you an acrostic in your outline and I want to go to Acts chapter 16. Acts the 16th chapter. How's everybody doing? Good. Acts chapter 16. And I know for some of you, this is a refresher course. And for others, this is something that is, is a brand new truth for you. And uh, when I was a, a child and my mom prepared dinner, we all ate the same thing. Now, if we had a friend over to our house, they may have been receiving something at our table for the very first time, but my mom didn't make something different for them. You understand the analogy. When you sit under the word of God, never allow yourself to think, I know that, I know that, because that's a subtle form of pride. Because we can know it here and not be living out of it here. Praise isn't something that comes out of our head. It's something that flows out of our heart. That's why we want to be a people of praise. So when my brother and I sat down and we had bologna, fried bologna sandwiches with mustard, which was really something that we would experience, and even though it's not on the approved diet of Charlene Brady, <laughs> we would have fried bologna and uh, sandwiches. One of my friends said, I, well, I've never had that. I said, well, it's really good. If, if mom uh, toast uh, the bread and we put mustard and Fritos on it and everything's better with Fritos and it just was just that extra crunch, something about the crunch and the saltiness uh, with, with the fried bologna. 
We had friends that came over. You get the analogy. They had never experienced that before, and so they were excited about it. They, it was something that was brand new to them. And I want to encourage us as believers, even though we've heard certain truths or been taught certain truths for many, many years, let's get excited about it, just like you're receiving it for the first time or hearing it for the first time or being reminded of it of the first time. So here's our acrostic. Acts chapter 16, let's read our text verse. We're going to pick up in the 25th verse. Uh, for those that you are unfamiliar with what's going on in this particular uh, setting in Scripture, is Paul and Silas have been in prison for doing a good deed. So they're there in unjust causes, and they minister to a young girl and delivered her from a spirit of divination. And it says in uh, verse 25, they were in their inner prison, uh, their backs had been beaten. They were in stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That's where I come with, to the conclusion is there's no such thing as silent praise. So in the, in the winter of their world, midnight, a very dark and looks like lifeless scenario, what did they choose to do? Sing and praise the Lord. And it said, and everybody else got in on it. They were listening. Suddenly, how many of you understand when the Bible says suddenly, it didn't happen suddenly? Now, it happened suddenly in that all of a sudden it happened, but it had been building for time. It, it had been, something had been leading up to a suddenly. Something leads to a suddenly. All the groundwork has to be done, and a heart has to be prepared, and a life has to be, you know, a faith has to be lived out uh, of your life day in and day out. And then you and I give God permission to do something in the moment, suddenly, or something that uh, we would say we would be almost unaware of it. Suddenly, this happened. There was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prisons uh, were shaken immediately, all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, uh, from sleep and it, that's what you do on the night shift, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And he called out for a light, he ran in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, here's this, this power, the presence of God has, has manifested in this specific location. Notice the whole town didn't experience an earthquake, only those that were in prison experienced the earthquake. And, and everybody was in a moment of shock and awe. The prisoners didn't leave their cells, but the, the keeper of the, of the prisoners was getting ready to end his life because he thought either I end it or the Roman government's going to end it. And Paul, in that moment, in that dark moment, cried out and brought light to this man who was getting ready to harm himself. There's power in praise. And how did Paul know that? I believe God gave him a word of knowledge, and, and he knew, I need to cry out. Someone's getting ready to do something that, that they don't need to do. And so... It said down in verse 30, and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. And when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. I, I'm not sure if this prisoner was the one that was, re, I mean, this guard was the one that was responsible for putting the stripes on these men's back, but he was part of the company of guards that was a part of that thronging, that beating. And now here he is washing their wounds and experiencing salvation because the power and the presence of God manifested. So I've written in your notes that uh, praise can be this. It pleases the Lord. All of us want to please our Heavenly Father. Let's be those people of praise. In everything, let's give praise. 
It's of the heart. We've talked about that. It is one of the greatest expressions of faith, regardless of what season we're in or what we're going through. It is an expression of faith. It reminds us of God's faithfulness. It reminds us of his faithfulness. We have a tendency to forget. Thus, the admonition in Scripture over and over again is forget not. Don't forget the Lord. Don't forget his benefits. When we're praising him, we're reminded of those things. It allows us to overcome the temptations to complain. One of the most uh, sobering scriptures in, in all of God's word is Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling, fight, uh, fault finding, and complaining. And, and uh, most of us uh, can improve our grade in that particular uh, uh, commandment. We can do better than what we are doing. Uh, here's what complaining does. This isn't really our, our content uh, or our subject matter, but just so that you can create a, an awareness in your life how dangerous it is. Complaining opens the door to the destroyer. Complaining opens the door to the destroyer. We, we don't need that happening in our life. All right. I means we want to invite his presence and his power. So where there's praise, the environment changes. It changes. We can either be a thermostat Christian or we can be a th thermometer Christian, but you can't be, you know, you got to choose in the moment. And let's choose to be the thermostat. Let's set the temperature. It silences the voice or the lies of the enemy because the enemy can't stay where there's praise. He can't stay in that environment. You shut him down because he can't stay where the power of God is. He has to flee. He has to run. There's power in praise. It enlarges our heart towards him. Much better than the Grinch. His heart got enlarged and large and large. But praise, when, we, when our eyes are up and our hands are up and our voice is lifted up, then our heart is impacted for good. It grows. It's enlarged. What happens when we grumble and complain? Everything in our world gets small. What happens when we begin to praise and worship and honor the Lord? Everything opens up and enlarges. I believe God wants us to live in a larger place. I believe he wants to experience more of who he is. Praise is that environment that invites him, stills the enemy, and protects our heart from complaining. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.